and uh, many of you are uh, blessed to blessed to live here. So last week we talked about there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Uh, we talked about the first part of Romans eight, uh, and we couldn't keep the law perfectly even if we tried. Was really the point, right? Because we're weakened by the flesh, we're weakened by this this sinful body. But Jesus comes in the form of our sinful flesh. He comes in a body like ours, and he takes sin on himself and redeems his his family, redeems his children. And our bodies as believers now house the very glory of God. The Spirit of God lives in us. And like the Spirit of God in the temple, remember back in the temple in Jerusalem, and particularly the temple in the desert, it was like the, the temple could not contain the glory of God. Just like... Well, we're that same way. Um, I, I don't know how many of you have, have gone through that time in your life where you're like, you know, I'm just kind of living in sin or I'm living without God or I'm living kind of away from, from home base. And yet, even there, I'm telling people about Jesus or I'm talking, that, you know, it's, it's, it just comes out of it. There's this living water. There's, there's the spirit of God that lives in us and it's coming out even when we don't want it to. So next, uh, we, we learned we're no longer living as slaves to fear since God has taken the wages of our sin. There's no, there's no fear. We have no fear in our lives. There's no fear of death, right? Which is a crazy thing because the world is just, we're, we're completely obsessed with death. Either we don't want to talk about it at all or we're really focused on it all the time. But there's this fear of it in our, in our lives. It's resident that God has taken away. He's taken away the fear of death. And now we are part of a new family. God's adopted sons and daughters who call God Abba, Father. The God of the universe, we have the ability now to call him Abba, Father. And then it talks about the creation groans. Even the mountains, even the flowers The whole creation is groaning under the weight of this fallen world. And it's groaning, waiting for the sons of God, the daughters of God to be revealed. We are being revealed, and even the creation is celebrating that. So today, we're going to talk a little bit about what happens after that. Because we really talked about the gospel, right? And and the gospel is this, this thing God has been doing. And today we're going to talk a little bit about what's the result of that. And what does it look like from God's perspective? What does does our walk with God look like from God's perspective? Um, I want you to imagine for a minute that Jesus were to walk in the doors here. And he, Jesus says, uh, Sam, um, why don't you uh, back off? We'd like to, uh, I'm going to go ahead and take over from here. And I would gladly sit down, right? And he would say, I want you to hear, I just had this conversation with my father. The Holy Spirit has been praying for you. And my father and I have just had this conversation. And and the God of the universe is now saying, he has decided to give you a life that is completely good. In fact, he has decided to make everything in your life go well from now on. Would that feel like heaven on earth? It'd be amazing to have Jesus stand here and say that to you. Well, Romans 8, 28 kind of says that. For we know that God works all things together for good for those who love him, for those who are called according to his purpose. If you're with me, uh, let's let's start at Romans 8, 26. We're going to read the entire rest of the chapter. Last week, we just kind of took pieces at a time. We'll we'll go back to that. But I I want you to listen to this, and, and listen to it as though it's a letter written to you. You're, you're a church member in Rome. Uh, Rome is not that much different than uh, probably tell you right, Colorado, right? It's a mess. There's all kinds of stuff going on. The Epicureans, they're all saying, oh, the gods, you know, they, they created this thing and it's just been floating in space since then. They have no care, they have no desire to, to even interact with their creation. The, the Jews are uh, this band of Christian Jews now who've come to Christ. They're being persecuted by the Jews that didn't come to Christ because there are a bunch of Jews that also live in Rome and they, and they hate the Christians, right? So there's this mess and, and Paul's writing into a mess kind of like ours. Perversion everywhere. Listen to these words. 
Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we don't even know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes with us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? And who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. Who's to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died, more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. I hear an amen. Amen, brother. <laughs> if that doesn't light your fire, your wood's wet. <laughs> right? Whew. I read those words, and, and I'm telling you guys, this is my favorite chapter. Some of you who weren't here last week, uh, Cooper and I, Worked on memorizing this chapter when he was like seven years old. <laughs> he wanted to memorize my favorite chapter. He said, oh, yeah, Dad, let's memorize that together. 39 verses. It took us months. But I'm telling you, this, this chapter is so rich. There's no condemnation. I consider that the pain and agony and troubles of this current age are not even able to be compared with what's going to be revealed to us. All these great passages... And we're going we're gonna to see a couple more today that we just read. And you're just like, wow, this is amazing. The word of God to a people in Rome. It was written to them, but it is written for us. Isn't that great? Not all the Bible is written to us. Have you noticed that? You know, like the Babylonian thing. In fact, a lot of people go to the Old Testament and, and they try to make all those passages fit today. I go, you know... Maybe they were written to people who were just about to go into Babylon for 70 years. Not to us, but they were written for us. They were written so, so that we could be edified, so we could learn of who God is. Well, I'm going to break into the passage, you guys. Oh, man. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, verse 26 says. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. So we have the groanings of the, all, all of the creation, right? And then he says just before this, there's a groaning that we have, that we are groaning for the sons of God to be revealed, for our adoption as sons. And then he says, the Spirit is also groaning. He understands where we are. He understands the world that we live in. He understands the troubles of our lives. And he is groaning as he prays for us to the God of the universe. God the Spirit is now interceding for us. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So, so Satan, Satan is like out there, he doesn't really know what God's will is all about, right? But the Spirit does. If Satan were trying to accuse us, which we'll talk about that in a minute, he doesn't know what God's up to. But the Spirit of God does know what God's up to. And he's praying for us according to the will of God. So when we say, Lord, if, if it's your will, let this happen. 
the Spirit is saying, I already know what the will of God is. And he's praying with the ability to see it. And we know, this is great, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. How in the world does that promise even make sense some days? God, how can you be working all things together for my good? My, my life is a mess. The world's a mess. The country's a mess. The, Europe's a mess. I, I, We've got all these things going on around us. We go, what in the world is God up to? And there are one of two options. Either God is good and he doesn't have any power, which is what the world kind of thinks, or he's all powerful, but he's not good, right? They get the idea that, okay, if God was really good and he had all power, there wouldn't be anything going wrong in the world. Or he's, he's got to be this, this crazy God who doesn't really love anybody and is allowing these things to happen and making the world such a mess, right? But this passage really seems to fly in the face of that. It says, no, 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 hold it, hold it. God is good and he's all powerful. So now we see the things through the lens of that. We see the things in the world and we say, okay, there's some way that God is using everything to his glory and our good. Now, who does he do it for? Who's he working all these things for? Those who love him and those who are called according to his purpose. Now, when I was a kid, we went to a little evangelical free church in, uh, in Denver. And um, our pastor would bring in special speakers every once in a while. And they'd do like a, a week-long kind of a revival sort of a service. But it was to really say, okay, let's dig deeper into, into the Christian life. This guy named Richard Owens Roberts... He was named after a Puritan, already. So first of all, he's, he's named after John Owens. That's his middle name. And he would always go by Richard Owens Roberts. We never called him Bob. He's about this tall, and he started his first sermon ever like this. He said, do you love God? Yes. Let me ask it again. Do you love God? Yes. Right? I mean, this guy was... He was rock star quality. We all stood there, and I was in my 20s at this point, right? And uh, just kind of early 20s. I had a buddy of mine. We were sitting together, and we both just went, what does this mean? And, and, the, guy, and, and the guy just let us sit there, and then he said, do you love God? Do you desire God? Do you want God? Do you, do you long for relationship with God? Are you diligently seeking God? Are you, are you loving him by keeping his commandments? Are you loving him by loving your neighbor? Are you, do you love God? Oh, man. The, the deepest of conviction comes on all of us at that point, right? And I ask you, like I would ask Ed, my buddy, for about six months after that, we'd see each other across the parking lot. And I'd, Ed, do you love God? Yes. He, right? He'd yell back, yes, do you love God? Did you love God today? Did you love someone else? Do you love God? Do you love God? Because this promise is for those who love God. This is not for everybody. This is for the whole world. God's not just making things right for everybody. He's loving his children who love him. Do you love God? And then the question is, why do you love God? How could it be that we would love God? First John says, we love him because he first loved us. Wow. We love him because he first loved us. In fact, the, the idea is that we love, period. We're able to love because God loved us. We're able to love others. We're able to love God. We're able to love each other in the, in the body of Christ because God first loved us. One of my favorite verses is out of Jeremiah 31.3. It says this. He says it to the, the nation of Israel. And last week we talked about us being grafted in to the nation of Israel, right? We've been made part of that tree. So we're part of this promise. I have loved you with an everlasting love. With loving kindness have I drawn you to myself. Let 
that resonate in your heart this week? God has loved you with an everlasting love and his loving kindness. The psalm says his loving kindness is better than life. It's better than anything. His loving kindness is drawing us into relationship. And this passage, it's real easy for this next few verses to go, okay, we're going to get real theological about this. And Isom and I talked about this today or the other day. And, you know, this is really about relationship. It's God's view, but it's about God coming with his whole heart to his children and drawing them into his heart. All things work together for good. That's the promise. What would, what would consider all things? How about uh, the, the death of a spouse? We do retreats at the lodge that many of them are um, heart-wrenching retreats. Our next uh, retreat next week will be with women who have lost a spouse or lost a child or who were abused seriously as children who are now dealing with the grief. And I'm going to say to them, God works all things together for good to those who love him, to those who is called according to his purpose. And a grieving mom who lost a baby, I, that's a deep resonance there. How about, how about your greatest joy? Some of you have sold businesses. You sell a business, all of a sudden you've got this liquidity event. You go, wow, worked my whole life to build this, or my father did, and, and now we've sold it. Now we have a liquidity event, and you go, wow, it's this pile of money. This, does that work together for good? Could that throw you off track? It could, except for God's children. God's using even that. Your greatest blessings, your best friend. You lost your best friend. All these things are being used for, go for your good. Because God's writing a story in creation. And you get to be part of it. We want to make God part of our story. Romans 8 is to show you that you are part of his story. Which is way bigger than you can imagine. We'll get there. So... God teaches us that all things work together for good. Now, you have that option, or you have the other option. Think of the world that we live in. What did Nietzsche say, 19th century philosopher? Basically, this was his message. Beat everybody up and steal their stuff. That's his message, because it doesn't matter. Mercy, servanthood, that stuff, pff, that's not. That's, that's, a, that's a construct of the church to try to control people. And we live in a world that has become nihilistic. It's Nietzscheistic, as it were. We live in a world that lives with this, this kind of an idea. That all of it's just random. There's no real story here. It's just a random bunch of stuff. So God says, no, no. There's a, there's a reason for it. There's a purpose. Nietzsche would say, do you guys remember the song Hokey Pokey? Did you guys do the Hokey Pokey when you were kids? Everybody had to, right? Especially if you were in like skates, right? And then you're on ice skates and they're, okay, we're going to do the Hokey Pokey. But half the kids fall down. You're putting your right leg. You do the Hokey Pokey and you turn yourself around. That's what it's all about. I have this great bumper sticker in my office that says, what if the Hokey Pokey is what it's all about? right? What if? What if life is just the hokey pokey? And it's just, that's as meaningful as we get. And this verse steps into the middle of that and says, everything is being worked for good. What in the world is Nietzsche thinking? It's the reason that our kids are out there committing suicide and doing drugs and whatever else, right? Um, we, we had a friend of ours commit suicide years ago. Dear friend. Man, I love dearly. Um, he worked with homeless people downtown in Denver. He taught me more about the homeless 
and how to love people the way Jesus loves them. And Bruce had some serious health problems. They put him on a bunch of drugs, and the drugs literally made him crazy. I had some guys in my office, uh, had some young guns that uh, were in our real estate office. They kind of ran some of our construction stuff in Denver. And uh, one of them said, one day he said, um, you know, I don't understand this whole suicide thing. How can that be? He's a believer. Uh, his buddy, uh, also a guy I'm kind of mentoring and loving on, and he says, yeah, I don't get that. These guys are in their late 20s. I said, why don't you guys come talk about this with me when you're in your 40s? Because you won't have committed suicide or we won't be having a conversation. However, you'll at least know what it's like when the pressures of life squeeze in on a person. All of us in this room, we, don't, we didn't commit suicide. We may not have really even considered it seriously, but we at least can see how you get there. Well, take Jesus out of the equation and say to a 14-year-old kid who, who's trying to figure out life without God and without meaning, or an 18-year-old kid who, who believes, you know, if I help the old lady across the street, it's no better than if I run her over. There is no good or no evil in the world. If there's no definition of that, that there's no meaning, there's no reason to live. The only meaningful conversation you're going to have or the decision you're going to make is whether you're going to commit suicide today or wait till tomorrow. That's the world that we're living in. And Jesus is the hope in that. And he says, by the way, I'm working it all for good. Everything. Here's, here's God's view on it. Genesis 50, um, which is one of Jim's favorite <laughs> chapters. It's really fun. Uh, I, I had just been reading this and, and preparing for this sermon. And, and uh, Jim, we saw him the other day up on the mountain. We had taken a bike hike up to the Conoco and uh, the brewery up there. And, uh, and I didn't really realize how much 2,000 feet makes a difference in elevation. Because <laughs> we're at about 6,900. You guys are about 8,900. And it's all uphill both ways. I don't know what the deal is. I kept thinking, okay, we're going to go back. It's going to be easy getting back. And I'm going, what is the problem with this hill? But Jim said this is one of his favorite verses as well. So Joseph, he gets a, a coat from his dad. And, and his dad, Jacob, he's got 12 kids. You know, he's trying not to pick favorites, but he gives one of them a Technicolor coat. And that one also has all these dreams about his brother's. Hey, by the way, I just want to let you know I had a dream last night that you're going to be bowing down to me at some point. I, I just thought I'd tell you. <laughs> and they hate him for it, right? And they decide to kill him. And Reuben, the older brother, says, <laughs> we're not killing our brother, okay? We've killed lots of other people, but we're not killing our brother. So they sell him into slavery. And through, you know, a bunch of random events... That's option A. Or through a bunch of divine events, divine coincidences, I would call them, he becomes the second in charge in all of Egypt. The Pharaoh goes, you're my man. You do whatever you want to do. You, you feed the people. You take care of them because he interprets a couple of dreams that the Pharaoh has. Now, I have one or two options. Either that's completely random and... It all just happened by chance, and none of it meant anything. Or you can believe this verse. The brothers come to him. They figure out who he is. Now, they're not happy about it. And the reason they're not happy about it is because they tried to kill him, and they sold him into slavery, and they know that. And they're thinking, this guy who's the most powerful leader in the land next to the Pharaoh can have us vaporized in a moment. They say this to him. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not fear. Am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me. But God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. Joseph is real clear about this because God's been using these things in his life as well. All things have been working together for good in his life. 
Because God has used even his time in the dungeon, even his, be, his time being falsely accused of trying to take advantage of, of uh, Potiphar's wife. All these things are being used in his good as well to teach him that God is in control of all things and he can trust God. He says to his brothers, as for you, now he doesn't let them off the hook. He doesn't go, oh, it's no big deal. He says, you meant it for evil. Your will was that I would have evil upon me. But the God of all creation meant it for good. So that I could save possibly millions of people's lives. Pharaoh, uh, Egypt ran the world at that point. And Joseph fed them. So then we get an idea. His brothers also came and fell down, right? So now we, now we have to wonder about the second half of this. So the loving God, that's our response, right? Now God goes into kind of a glimpse behind the curtain. What's going on in heaven? How, how does the world really work? Here's what, here's what it said. For those, uh, I'm sorry, for those who are called according to his purpose, all things are working together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. What does it mean to be called according to his purpose? What could that possibly mean? That, that God is doing something and his purpose for us and that some were called according to his purpose. And then Paul goes into describing what that looks like from heaven. This is one of the most difficult passages in the New Testament. And, and I'm going to preach it not because I want to. I've wrestled with this one verse for now about nine weeks. Um, this is a tough verse. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you some of the background on it, and then you're going to have to just decide what you think it means because that's what we get to do with the Bible. But it's here, so i got to preach it. And it's in the middle of this incredible passage. It's, it's not like it's in so, some obscure place. It sits right in the middle. Listen to these words. For those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he, Jesus, might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. For those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Now, we could pass over this passage pretty quickly and just go, let's go to the next verse. But I don't think it does the text right to do that. And there, I, I want to say first, there is a huge disagreement that's been going on about 2,000 years about this particular verse. And I'll tell you what the disagreement is. All comes in the word foreknew, okay? So predestination is this sense that God predetermines something that's going to happen, right? And, and many in the church have kind of come down on the side that God knew what you were going to be like as a person. You, he knew you were going to choose him and respond to the gospel, and so he predestined you to do so, right? There are others who say, God kind of just did this of his own account, that, that God predestined based on something that that is about him and not really about us. And they would say that foreknow is really a knowledge of a person, not just about them. So the Bible uses the word gnosis two different ways. Um, primarily, it uses it as uh, this idea of knowledge about something. So diagnosis, that's the word knowledge. Prognosis. That means we, we, have a, we have diagnosis. That means we know what's wrong with you now. Prognosis is we, we know what's going to happen with you now. And so there's this gnosis that's a knowledge of. It's a cognitive thing. It's the second idea of gnosis that is Adam knew Eve and they conceived. It's the same word. It's a crazy thing. Adam knew Eve? Really? She, he read her resume and they conceived? Right? That's what it kind of feels like, right? It's just, yeah, he had this great knowledge of Eve and they had a baby. Same thing is said about Abraham. Abraham knew Sarah and they conceived. So there's this sense of intimacy about this word as well. So one camp would say, they knew about you, that God knew about you. And the other camp says, God knew you before the foundations of the earth. In this camp, you've got people who would say, you know what? God's outside of time and space. We don't understand it. It blows our minds to try to think of a being outside of time and space. But listen to this out of 2 Timothy. 
Um, it says, uh, it's 2 Timothy 1.9, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before time began. Imagine that God does something before time even begins. And that there's this relation. I have loved you with an everlasting love, with loving kindness have I drawn you. There's a sense that God has had this relationship with his children outside of time and space. I don't understand. It blows my mind. But it seems like Paul is trying to give us a glimpse of heaven. He's trying to give us a glimpse of who God is, of what kind of a a timeless, eternal, infinite, all-knowing, all-powerful God that we serve. So then he says this, those who he foreknew, he also predestined. And and that sense of predestiny, he, he, he was planning something to conform to the image of his son. What did he predestine us for? What did he, what did he, what, he, he knew us before the foundation of the earth. He, 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 he knew what we were going to be like. He, he predestined us for one thing, to be conformed to the image of his son. Now that is crazy. Jesus takes on the image of us, right? Says God did what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do by sending his own son in the form, in the likeness of sinful flesh, in order that we might be in the likeness of Jesus. That exchange, that trade that God is making, Jesus takes on our sin in the form of sinful flesh and dies for it in order for us to be like him, to be conformed to his image. And And that is sanctification. It's that sense of God forming us into people that he wants to be in his family. His family, he doesn't just go, you know, you prayed a prayer, but you know, you don't really have to do anything from now on. No, no, God is saying, no, no, we're in in an intimate relationship. We are together. So he predestined, then he called. Those who he called, those who he predestined, he also called. So there's a knowledge of God, so there's a, a destiny that God has for us, and then there's a calling, and we have to respond to that calling. And then he justified you. He justified you. The God of the universe, who is holy, because of what Jesus has done, has now made us holy. You are holy. You are completely justified. This is past tense. You are completely justified in God's court. There is, there is no condemnation. He's going to go to that next. Those who are justified, he also glorified. What is glorification? It's a sense of us becoming like Christ. And that's why God, at the end of this chapter, can say this. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God. It's God's story that he started before the world began. And you can't separate yourself from God's love. No one can separate you from God's love. No one can accuse you, he says, because God justifies, not us. So what if, what if we actually believe the gospel? What would that look like in our lives? If you believed that really there was no way you could lose, no way that you could lose, not one way, nothing you could do could screw it up, what would you do? What would your life look like? Is there a possibility that if you thought you could never be separated from God's love ever, Is there a possibility that you might have a homeless guy come to your house and you wash his clothes and his hair and give him a shower and say, why don't you stay with me until it gets a little warmer outside? It's too risky. Can't do it. No, it's not risky at all. Because remember, the God of the universe has got this thing. 
It's not the hokey pokey. It's not you trying to do it, right? It's, it's not just random. There's something happening. God's writing a story, and you're part of it. So if you believe the gospel, you can do crazy stuff. You might call your adult son and beg his forgiveness for treating him as less important than your work as he was growing up. Because as I can tell you, it's a lot easier to build a business than it is a relationship with a 14-year-old boy. Or with your wife sometimes. I think workaholism, at least in my life, has always been kind of like, man, that's so hard at home. I'm staying here. Because I can tell these people what to do. They actually do it, right? <laughs> Most of the time. <laughs> uh, not as much these days as it used to be. <laughs> You might give half your retirement fund to a Bible translation project so that a tribe of 500 people can have the Bible in their language. You might offer a girl who finds out she's pregnant a place to stay until the baby comes at your house. You might sit with a gay man who's had 400 partners and just weep with him. You might find that a river of life is now flowing through you. And you might love people the way Jesus does. And you might give your life for them. And you might be part of God working all things together for good in somebody else's life. Believe the gospel. Believe the good news. And help somebody else to believe it. Call other people. Get on the phone with somebody you haven't talked to for a while and say, I just want to call and tell you I love you. This love of God spilling out in, in the streets of Telluride, folks, this, this town will change. We're not going to change by beating people into, into submission. We're going to change the world by putting a towel on and washing feet and speaking the truth in love and just believing the gospel. Lord Jesus, we are thankful.